The story itself is is very, very different from most UFO stories because mm. um, it actually runs backwards. It works backwards, uh, which is what fascinated me when, when I first heard the tale. And, and that is that the majority of stories, you have an absolutely cracking story with loads of visuals in it. People talk about these flying saucers descending in lights and there's all these, you know, you can imagine the special effects and mm. the rest of it. And most programs do a really good job of the reconstructions and they have all the eyewitnesses on. And when it comes to the end of the program and it comes to the crunch, they can't show you anything. Mm. There's like a bump in the ground or a broken twig or a burn mark on a mm. tree or, you know, some light, you know, blurred light in the sky and that's it. But this story is the exact reverse. What we had to do was we had to start with the evidence and the evidence are these fragments from, from the UFO. We've got three pieces of the green outer shell of some kind of vehicle. We've got the inside of, of, of the, the casing in the forms of pieces of foil. And there's at least a hundred other fragments scattered all the way around the country that we know of. So we're starting with the evidence. You know, I'm actually sat there holding a piece of a flying saucer, you know, a piece of a UFO. And I'm thinking, what on earth is this? You know, here it is. How did it get here? What's the story? In January 1983, a mysterious flying craft of some kind crashed in fields just outside Aberystwyth in mid Wales. Strangely, only one local newspaper was to run the story about this event, and yet it could prove to be as significant as the Roswell crash in New Mexico. Can we claim to have hard evidence of this craft? Well, watch on. From that day to this, it still remains unidentified. No aircraft was missing, no pilots were missing, no mechanical things were found on the site. We can only conclude that this remains debris from a UFO, an unidentified flying object. In 1983, one of the World News Clipping Agencies sent Gary Rowe a clipping of a crash near Aberystwyth in mid Wales. This is the story that followed. 
The report in a national newspaper was headed strange debris out of the sky and it was from the Sunday Express the 23rd of January 1983. It indicated that an unidentified flying object had crashed in Wales. The similarities with the famous Roswell incident became gradually too obvious. Though Gay was fortunate enough to be living in North Wales at the time, nonetheless the reported incident was some considerable distance, so he contacted the farmer and obtained his permission to visit the crash site. After hastily organising a reconnaissance team and several hours of driving, the team arrived. As the team examined the damage, Mr Evans recounted the entire series of events from the beginning. He began, The incident must have happened in the dead of night as there was no sign of the debris late on the previous evening. Early the following morning as he trudged the fields to tend his newborn lambs he was confronted with masses of scattered debris extending over an area of four of his fields. He telephoned the local police station. The local police arrived and after they had conducted a brief examination the RAF were called in. They removed every scrap of evidence that they could find and only one section taken away had what looked like part of a number on it. The pieces ranged in size from an inch to six feet. The men continued the search by torchlight as darkness fell. Mr Evans described it as a scene straight from a James Bond movie. So thorough was the military clean-up operation that both metal detecting and archaeology were unable to shed any more light on the UFO crash. All of the fields and the forest had been completely cleared of all the evidence. Maybe the answer to all this rests with the civilian UFO crash recovery team who got there before the military cleanup operation. Or is this just going to turn into another story of strange noises, vanished evidence and weird lights in the sky? It's impossible for us to be the only intelligent life. That is absolutely out of the question. I mean, you've only got to gaze out to those stars and out to that star field and realise that there are countless millions of planets out there, um, any one of which could be the same as us. So there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be another life form that has um, developed further than we have. Um, but by further, obviously, that you know, beggars def definition. It's very difficult to say what further would be. You know, maybe they've survived, they've changed, they've got technology we haven't got, they're using things we don't have. Maybe there is something out there in the universe we don't know about and they've got it and we haven't, you know, um, travel in the, in the light spectrum or something so they're able to jump from one place to another faster than we are. So they're doing something we're not. By virtue of the fact we don't know what they're doing, that's what makes them unidentified, that's what makes them a mystery. So I'm quite willing to accept that there is actually life out there. That, that doesn't present a problem. But the second alternative, which I find more intriguing and it's a lot harder to, to prove, there is a possibility that we are doing something now that seriously affects our future and that those people who are out there in the future have found some way to come back. So maybe the flying saucers we're seeing are in fact time machines. They're coming back from our own future to try to influence us and change us in some way. Which means that maybe we do survive and we do develop on and we do come up with uh, new inventions and new ideas. You know, maybe. Uh, the physics is altered in some way such that we you know we can break through and, and uh, cheat time in that way but i think it could be one of those two possibilities if i was a betting man if i was uh, going to lay odds i would say it's either it's a civilization from another planet that's more advanced than us or it's ourselves or something we've created coming back at this time because it's an important time in our history. The second one's quite appealing because I'm an archaeologist, so mm. in a very physical sense I'm involved in time travel. I'm picking things up that were dropped by people in the past. And the possibility that something may break through from the future intrigues me. I mean, people always look for a third way. And it's a reasonable third way, okay? Um, I know that there are things out there 
for which we do not have an explanation. Um, not just in terms of UFO debris, but in other areas as well. When you start looking at things that turn up on archaeological sites that shouldn't, um, which is termed alien technology, you know, things pop up in places where they're not supposed to, at times when they're not supposed to, you know. Sooner or later you have to accept that there are mysteries out there, which are very difficult to pin on us. Mm. It's very difficult to actually say that it's us that's doing them. And in the modern day and age, I think uh, a lot of the books that have been produced and things, it's actually easier for people to believe that it's not us. It's easier to say, well, it must be something else. It's interesting to note here that the RAF search team at the site were unable to recognise any of the debris that belonged to any known aircraft. They also admitted to being baffled as their radar scanners had not detected the incident or anything unusual leading up to the incident. In fact, two weeks later they admitted that they were still unable to confirm that it was aircraft material they had recovered, let alone offer an explanation. In their own words, an RAF spokesman said, The debris certainly had nothing to do with us. We are examining the fragments to try to piece them together in the hope of a clue as to where it came from and what it is. We dispatched professional historian and researcher Scott Lloyd to the National Library of Wales to see if any other newspapers of the day carried the story of the UFO crash. Well, from the date you gave me, I went to the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, which is not that far away from the site, and I went through all the local newspapers for a week before and a couple of weeks after, trying to see if there's any reference to an object crashing in a field in Tlan Isla. Um, the local papers deal with every minor event that happens in the local villages, and I was very surprised to find no reference to it whatsoever, which I thought was a little unusual. However, there was some correspondence in the Cambrian news between um, locals of the area um, discussing the fact that Hercules aircraft had been flying very low in the area, um, but that was the closest I could find to anything crashing. I find it very unusual that an event that could reach a national newspaper wasn't recorded in the local newspapers, and this is in English and Welsh. So there's three or four local papers I looked at. So really, I'd be um, interested to see what other evidence we can gather. This article here um, is a photocopy, so unfortunately we don't have the whole page, which would give us a definite dateline on the top. Um, it's handwritten, the source, as the Sunday Express for the 23rd of January 1983, which is the period I, I looked at in the National Library. Now we have to hope that the person who wrote this A got the newspaper right and B and probably more importantly got the date right otherwise I've been looking in the wrong place. Really I'd like to continue the research by um, trying to contact the police in Aberystwyth to see what report they have of the incident and also there's a reference here to the secretary of the Cardiganshire Farmers Union so I'd also quite like to see if it's possible to speak to him um, and then we can maybe narrow this down a bit more and of course the journalist who wrote the article uh, an Andrew Chapman hopefully we can get hold of him and then maybe we can get closer to seeing why it didn't appear in any of the local newspapers Well, that's the interesting thing. How did a journalist for a national newspaper find a story about a small village in, in mid Wales when none of the local newspapers seem to reference it? So that is quite odd. I'd, be, I'd like to speak to the journalist to see where he did get it from. The other line of inquiry is also contacting the MOD to see what they had to say about the matter because according to this article um, they gave a, a statement saying there was no aircraft out at the time and their radar scanners picked up nothing unusual so it would be interesting to clarify that point. 
So I still think we have a few lines of inquiry left. It's so long since the original newspaper article appeared that its author, Andrew Chapman, has no idea what was his source material for writing that article. Furthermore, our researchers at the National Library of Wales didn't reveal any other newspaper article on the UFO crash. So once again, we've drawn a blank. The next best hope, perhaps, is to investigate the crash site itself. The absolute origins of the story, as Gary himself says, is this newspaper article here that says, Strange Debris Out of the Sky. And it says this, this Sunday Express, 23rd of January 1983, Strange Debris Out of the Sky. An astonishing sight greeted farmer Irwell Evans as he trudged across his fields to tend his newly born lambs. Hundreds of pieces of honeycomb metal foil were strewn over an area the size of three football pitches. Huge twisted alloy plates painted green on one side, grey on the other, lay everywhere, and in a nearby copse branches had been sheared off trees. Mr Evans telephoned the police. Soon his farm at Clonilla near Aberystwyth, Wales, was like a film set from a spy thriller. Police took away fragments of metal for analysis. A team of uniformed RAF men with plainclothes officers combed the land and nearby woods, using flashlights as darkness began to fall. And it says, baffled. Among the pile of debris taken away was an aerial and a large chunk of metal with part of a serial number on it. Everyone concerned was convinced that whatever it was that covered Mr Evans' field had fallen out of the sky at dead of night. But after two weeks, the riddle still remains. Police are baffled, so too are the RAF. No one in the close-knit Welsh community heard a plane that night. Nothing unusual showed up on RAF radar scanners. Mr Evans, 29, who farms his 260 acres single-handed, said, Whatever tumbled from the sky broke up on impact. It must have been a fair size. Wreckage was scattered across four fields. Had it hit buildings, there's no doubt the devastation could have been terrific. It must have come down the night before I found it, for the area was clear in the afternoon when I checked the flock. Yet I heard nothing at all unusual. Although the pieces themselves were extremely light, they must have fallen with some force to sever branches off trees. It is all very disturbing. Mr Emir Hughes, Secretary of Cardiganshire Farmers Union, said, I've asked the Ministry of Defence for an explanation, but so far have had no reply. The RAF say they had no aircraft out at the time this debris must have landed, nor were there any manoeuvres. Not only that, their radar scanners picked up nothing unusual. Meanwhile, villagers are still speculating about the debris. Could it be part of a large weather balloon? No, say Aberystwyth with police. Too much metal. Part of a satellite. Unlikely. Any remains would be charred. We have no explanation as yet. It's baffling. An RAF spokesman said... The debris certainly had nothing to do with us. We are examining, examining the fragments to try to piece them together in the hope of a clue as to where it came from and what it is. That is the only first-hand account, if you like, at the time, taken um, just before, presumably before, the 23rd of January 1983. So the obvious thing to do is to go and speak to that reporter. It's a mm. chap by the name of Andrew Chapman. Now, Andrew Chapman still still works for the Sunday Express. So we got in contact with him over the internet. We had a, a number of, of um, discourses between us. At one point he said, leave it with me and I'll see what I can do. I'll check the Sunday Express archives and my own notes and try and find the source. He then himself, Andrew Chapman, tra tracked back. But you bear in mind this is, uh, I mean, at the time we were producing it, it was 24 years. So he had to go back 24 years to find the source. Um, and basically he has no idea. He really does have no idea where that article came from. Other than the fact that obviously he spoke to the representatives uh, of, of the Cardingham, Cardinghamshire Farmers Union, etc., and, and the local police, he did the research at the time, so he knows that the contents of that story are, are factual. But apart from that, uh, he was quite surprised to learn that nobody else had reported it himself. So that extra bit of research just served to, to deepen the mystery. In fact, it's quite exciting, really, because instead of having it all laid out before us and, and, and sort of having, you know, a beginning, a middle and no end, you know, the whole thrill of doing this is the fact we've got the end, but we don't the have middle. the middle or the beginning, you know, the, the whole start of the story is not there, 
you know, it starts from one article, one newspaper article, one investigation team that made it to the crash, one witness in the form of the farmer, you know, one case containing debris, and that's it. They found the farm situated in a beautiful rural area of Wales near to Aberystwyth. The farmer, Mr Evans, aged 29 at the time, turned out to be very pleasant, helpful and sociable. He led the team across four of his fields, indicating where he had earlier discovered hundreds of pieces of metallic foil and other parts of a crashed craft. He described how all the pieces had looked like shattered glass with jagged edges some of the shattered and twisted plates were over six feet in size. The overall impression was that some large aircraft must have exploded above the area. The 260 acre farm is bordered on the southwest side by a mixed wood copse owned by the Forestry Commission. As the team approached the boundary of the field and the trees, it became apparent that, whatever the flying object was, it had collided with the trees. After thanking Farmer Evans for his very graphic account of the events, it was time to conduct a search of their own. That the authorities had done a pretty thorough job of cleaning the area became obvious when, after more than an hour's search, the team had failed to find a single scrap of material in any of the large fields. The team next concentrated their efforts in searching the wooded area, at first without success. It was not long before the first piece was discovered. Other finds followed as they searched high in the trees and used the damaged avenue as a rough guide to the search area. We've travelled some miles outside Aberystwyth to the sleepy Welsh village of Clanilla and we've spent some time interviewing the local residents. Unfortunately, there are not many people left from 25 years ago and none of the ones who are remember the crash. So, it looks like we've hit another dead end. The most important story that's relevant to um, the DVD, the UFO, the interest in UFOs, um, two UFO sightings. There's two times when I've when I've seen them. Uh, one was in 1976, which is in this country the hot summer of 1976, which literally cracked the flags and baked uh, baked the ground solid. And I was out camping with friends at a, a local farm, and uh, we couldn't put the tent up, so we literally just threw the tent on the floor, had it as a ground sheet, and slept on that which means that you're then out in the open under the stars, out in the countryside, there's no light pollution, it's a, a beautifully clear night. Um, the heavens just went on forever, absolutely enormous uh, sky. And at some point in the early hours I woke up and noticed that coming from the horizon, the distant horizon, one of the stars was moving. So you've got this star that's moving through the star field fairly slowly, you know, and I'm watching it coming and I'm thinking, aeroplane? helicopter, you know, maybe something like that. Anyway, it keeps coming and of course you can see the full sky overhead and it comes till it's probably not far central, not far off central above us. Um, and it's going at this nice steady slow speed like that and then all of a sudden it goes wallop, 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 gone. What on earth is that? What star, you know, at that distance, because it looked like part of the star field, is capable of bouncing literally left, right, left, right, gone, at that speed across the entire sky, you know? And you sort of, you know, you blink and you pinch yourself and you wonder if you're still awake. And, you know, so that was the first, if you like, that's the first encounter uh, with anything like a UFO. Then a year later, uh, the next summer, 
I'm up on top of a local hill which affords a particularly good view of the Mersey Valley. And again, I'm not up there for any other reason than to enjoy the view. It's, um, it's early evening, sun's gone down, but there's still a sort of blueness to the sky. And you can see the steam coming off the local power station and you can see Warrington, it's beginning to light up. You know, there's a hint of light there. And as I'm looking up towards Liverpool, you can see a light coming up the Mersey Valley, coming, following the river, the river itself. Um, the unusual thing about the light is it looks like a helicopter, but it looks like a helicopter with three searchlights underneath. Mm -hmm. So you've got these lights scanning the ground, um, looking for something. So you think, oh, it's got to be a police helicopter, you know. There's a hint of colour to the, to the lights as well. So, oh, it's it's, it's got to be a helicopter. So you, you see it coming up, and it passes through the steam that's coming off the power station. Right. Now, steam is pretty jolly hot anyway, you know, mm. and it, it's not the sort of thing a helicopter would do. The police certainly wouldn't fly through the, the, the steam coming off a power station. So at that point, I'm thinking, this is, this is not, it's not a helicopter, you know, it's something else. And it keeps coming up the Mersey Valley, but each time it changes direction, it does so really quickly. So it doesn't curve like a helicopter, it jumps you know, when it changes directions. So it's moving and it's jumping back and two. And you can see the lights moving underneath, and then you've got other lights on it. There's, um, I think there's blue lights, white lights, red lights, and you can see that it's actually the wrong shape. It looks exactly like something out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You know, it really does. You've got that flare off the lights and everything. You can see it coming up the Mersey Valley. And as it's coming up, it almost reaches the bridge at Warrington. So you can see it's coming, you know, very, very close to the bridge. And all of a sudden it just goes out, the whole lot, all the lights just go out completely and you can just see a shape vanish at breakneck speed, straight up, vertically into the sky, gone, literally, what? straight up. So all you saw is this blur, it looked like a black blob heading skywards, you know, but everything just went off like someone had pulled the mm -hmm. plug and then it just heads straight off. And the interesting thing is, there's a book around called Mysteries of the, I think it's called Mysteries of the Mid-Mersey Valley. Mm -hmm. And on the cover, it shows the lighthouse down at Hale yeah. with a flying saucer with a light coming out from underneath. And it, I, I noted at the time the date, because I, I had a diary, I noted the date. I can't remember off the top of my head now what it was, but the date is the same date as Jenny Randalls, who wrote this book, included the story of this UFO doing exactly what I saw this thing do. The only difference being the witness who saw it from that end of the Mersey didn't see it disappear because they lost sight of it before it arrived at Warrington. So independently, and we're talking probably 15 or 20 years after the incident, this book comes out, independently the incident's confirmed by a second, a second viewer. So I've seen them. I've mm -hmm. seen these things flying, um, and flashes in the sky, and other shapes, and I've met people who have talked extensively about encounters they've had. Um, so yes, they're out there, and I definitely know they're out there. Over the months that followed, Gary and his team had the metal analysed by several experts, especially experts in the aerospace industry, and their findings can briefly be summarised as follows. The metal is a form of duralumin which is not inconsistent with material used to build fighter aircraft, although they express surprise at the high quality of the sample. They were unable to identify the green paint substance or the grey reflux surface. They were adamant that this green painted surface has not formed part of the outside skin of any aircraft as the mystery paint is not sufficiently aerodynamic. Associates in the armed forces and others in the aircraft construction industry were also asked to examine the samples and to offer an opinion. Their findings can be summarised. 
The only areas of an aircraft's construction that would normally require the use of honeycombed or sandwich strengtheners would be the control surfaces, i.e. the tail rudder or wing flaps. With a smile, one expert said, there is no known aircraft that could lose that quantity of its control surfaces so as to cover several fields with metallic debris and survive. I suggest that you go back and look for something big with engines sticking upright out of the ground. The investigation team returned to the site for a second time to search for debris but were unable to find any other scraps of the mystery foil or metallic plates. Undaunted, they made plans for a third visit, this time with more sophisticated equipment to aid their searches. However, they never made that third visit. But just before they could return, the Forestry Commission arrived and promptly set about removing the wooded cops. They said it was necessary because of wind damage. It's going back quite a few years now. Um, I think it was in Blackpool. I think we met in Blackpool. There was a conference there. Um, not a very salubrious place, Blackpool. Um, it's got this nice, interesting tower, famous the world <laughs> over. Um, fun fairs and casinos and things like that. And um, there was a, a conference there. It's not essentially a UFO conference. It's a, a conference called Probe. Mm. And it's quite appropriate because they, they look at world mysteries, uh, mysteries of all different kinds, and evidence is presented there of these mysteries. So it's quite useful to stay tuned into that community. And um, Gary was one of the speakers, uh, and I was a speaker at the same conference. And we were poles apart because I'm a sort of a scruffy hippie type character, and he's this gentleman, older gentleman in a suit. And as soon as we got talking, we realised we had an awful lot in common. Uh, at that time, I ran a group, he ran a group. Uh, he was doing things in his life that I was doing in my life. Uh, we had the same interest in archaeology and new parts and all sorts of mysteries and what have you. Um, so it all started over a Chinese in a Chinese banqueting place in, in Blackpool. And uh, what really got my attention was the bit when he said, well, um, I've got four pieces of a UFO in my garage. At which point I thought, hmm, I'm going to file that one away. Mm. And uh, I did file it away. It took quite a few years to come back to him on that particular issue. Um, I think it took about five or six years from us meeting. Um, he'd had problems with people dealing with that as an issue before. I think someone had tried to produce a, pro uh, a production of some kind to video or DVD mm -hmm. for him and had gone down the flying saucer route, you know, full on, which was not really what he wanted. He wanted more of a serious programme. Um, and so when I got to talking to him, he said, well, yeah, if you can do it seriously, then we'll seriously have a go at it. So although the production's relatively short in terms of DVD releases, the content of it took about two years to thoroughly investigate and then probably another six months to put the final production together. Consequently, I've known Gary now for about eight or ten years, you know. Well, in 83... I was running a UFO group in Deeside, so I had a lot of people very interested in UFOs with me, and a team ready to go with all sorts of equipment and so on, when all of a sudden I pick a newspaper up one day, I think it was the Daily Express actually, and there's this article, Strange Debris from the Sky, and it tells of a story of a farmer down there near Aberystwyth, on a farm at Lanilla. And this farmer claims that uh, he went out one morning and found all this strange debris on his land. Well, obviously, it had connotations to me of uh, Roswell. And I'm thinking, strange metallic debris spread all over fields. So immediately, I got a small team together and we headed off. We spoke to the farmer on the telephone. And this very nice gentleman, Irwell, was uh, really helpful. And he said, come down by all means. And we did. And when we went down there, he led us out from the farm and he took us out across these fields and he said, here before me in the morning, spread out over four fields, was metal fab fragments, uh, metal plate, uh, all convex shaped and glistening uh, metal foil all over the place, spread over an entire four field area. Uh, obviously, when I got there, 
there was no metal because, as he explained, that morning he got up and found the fragments and he immediately rang the police, suspecting that he'd had a plane crash on his land. The police arrived and duly they walk around and they examine the fields and obviously they can't be of a lot of help. They, they recognise that there's this metal foil there, so they contact uh, the crash retrieval, RAF crash retrieval. A gentleman arrived from that and they walk over the land here in the same story and examining this material and, and saying to each other, um, gosh, this isn't an aeroplane, we, we don't really know what it is. So they leave all this evidence in place and much later that same day uh, there's arrival of people from the Ministry of Defence. Now there are plain clothes people here directing uniformed officers. Uh, they've got all sorts of equipment and in the words of Mr Irwell himself, he said, it's like a scene here from James Bond. They've got lights all over the place, it's barricaded off and they're out there collecting these, these pieces of material. Well, by the next morning, when Irwell got up to see to his lambs and so on, he went out there and it was gone. Every piece of metal and the MOD, completely gone. Much later, uh, we arrived as a team to investigate. Obviously, they hadn't left a fragment anywhere. We searched the fields, we were unable to find any of it at all. In fact, the three people that were with me were really despairing in the end. Uh, you can imagine how excited we were, the chance of finding some of this debris. So I said to my colleagues, I said, there's no way, I don't care how good they are, the MOD and what they used, it would be very, very difficult to clear the forest that adjoined the land. So we set off amongst the branches and the trees and so on, and it wasn't long before we started to find strange fragments of this metal. And we recovered a number of pieces of this. Um, you could see clearly where to look because there was a line right through the top of this uh, wood or this forest if you like where all the treetops have been sheared off probably to a width of about 20 odd feet and all the tops of these trees were scattered straight in a line right across this field so it was easy to find where we needed to look uh, and uh, we came away with this material obviously we plan to go back with more people and make a, a you know more thorough search taking more equipment with us. Well, you would not believe this, but that very same week I had another phone call from the farmer and he said, you're still welcome to come down and do your research and so on, but you might be wasting your time. So I said, well, how's that then? He said, well, you know that forest, as I'm speaking to you, they're actually removing it. I said, pardon, they're removing a forest? Yes, he said. So I contact the Forestry Commission and say, would you like to tell me why you're removing the forest? And a Forestry Commission person, and it sounded as if he was smiling, although obviously I couldn't see him on the telephone. He said, um, well, it's wind damage, you know. And I said, wind damage? Do you usually remove a forest for wind damage? No, he said, but we're removing this one. So I took it from that, obviously, that the Ministry of Defence had decided that the best way to remove any evidence in the forest was to take the trees away. And that's exactly what they did. Or is this just going to turn into another story of strange noises, vanished evidence and weird lights in the sky? If you'd just like to come this way, I've got some other pieces here to show you. There it is. As you can see, this large piece is almost like shattered glass around the edge. In fact, the only straight part of it is where we've had to cut samples for testing. On top of this grey material, this resin material, uh, stood this sort of uh, honeycombed metal. A sample of that in the case there that you can see, almost like tin foil, giving it enormous strength across the outside. So if you can imagine, we've got this material sandwiched between two plates. You notice that it's all completely shattered around the edges, almost like shattered glass. Well, as a matter of fact, I've got a small sample of the material here. Um, on the one side, as you can see, it's a green colour, and on the other side, it's a grey colour. The grey colour is some kind of resin that's not been properly identified yet. And obviously there's this dual element in between. 
you notice that all the edges of the material look as if it's broken glass, it's shattered. The only straight edge, in fact, is the one that I've actually cut to take samples from. All the pieces are of a slightly concave nature, indicating that this has either exploded or imploded at some time. What's interesting, though, is the strength of this material. It's extremely strong, given that it's so light. Very, very strong. I can just bend it or flex it, but it would take quite a serious amount of effort to put a crease into it. I think you'll agree with me that is extremely unusual. On the side that you can see that's grey, where the resin was, attached to this, there was honeycombed uh, metal foil that resembles baking foil, but all neatly honeycombed. And obviously the two pieces of metal uh, went either side sandwiching this honeycomb between them. And the result is, of course, extremely uh, stronger material that can't even be crushed and yet extremely light at the same time. Quite incredible construction, really. Well, he was very, very clever because mm -hmm. um, there's a story attached to this, so I suppose I should really tell the story. That is a key ring mounted at the back of this um, magnifying glass is a key ring, and he had a 100 of those key rings produced. The reason being, word got out through the authorities, um, probably through the farmer who, who, um, whose land the, the UFO crashed on, Word got out to the authorities that pieces of something had been recovered. And uh, the, cl the classic thing is, is you hear of these big black cars pulling up with all the windows blacked out, you know, the doors open and the gentlemen get out and they're all in black with dark sunglasses, you know, and passes hanging, you know. There is a measure of truth in that because these guys actually did turn up and came knocking on Gary's door. But Gary's answer was, OK, I'll do you a deal. And I thought this was incredibly clever. His answer was... Um, I've produced a hundred of these key rings, he said, with, with fragments of the UFO in, and scattered them amongst people all over the UK. And the deal with the men in black was very simple. If you don't come after my pieces, I won't tell these hundred people 
to give their pieces to the media, and that was 25 years ago. So 25 years ago, there were a hundred of these little Kieran's knocking around, and of course the gentleman, the men in black, thought, okay, there's nothing we can do, the truth is out there, it's got out, you know, he's, he's allowed these pieces out, we can't possibly get all hundred pieces back because they're scattered around people that we don't know, and they literally, in silence, got back in the car, drove off and were never seen again. But as I said, that was 25 years ago. The atmosphere has considerably changed now in the UFO community. Um, and I was fortunate enough to acquire one of the pieces, so there it is. I don't know if anyone can actually see that. Now, following that, obviously we were very curious with these pieces of metal that we'd recovered to find out what they were. And we were very lucky in the end to have someone who was a foremost metallurgist uh, to take these pieces and investigate them. This person is associated with the aerospace industry and therefore had all the facilities to go ahead and do this sort of research. Well, eventually I got a report back. I must admit that most of it went clean over the top of my head. I'm not a metallurgist myself. But the gist of it is that the metal is some form of duralumin, which is not inconsistent with the kind of thing that you build a fighter aircraft from. But there were strange anomalies in it that interested these people. They were talking about uh, a strangeness to it. Its uh, strength to uh, volume ratio was extremely high. And also they were talking about uh, uh, a sort of pure alloy. Now you can get a pure alloy, I'm not quite sure, but the purity of it interested them. They were utterly convinced that they knew no one that could make this metal. And they were very much obviously like to make it themselves. They thought this was just the stuff we ought to be making aeroplanes out of. Um, the result of it was that we had to settle for that information and to this day, uh, nothing else has occurred that would indicate it's anything other than that. Although we have had separate tests done on a few occasions. It also had some kind of strange resin on one side of it. Uh, the nature of this has not been fully analysed, although we are aware of some of the chemicals that it's composed of. And I'm told that the colour, this coloration that was on one side of it, is not an aerodynamic uh, material. From that day to this, it still remains unidentified. No aircraft was missing, no pilots were missing, no mechanical things were found on the site associated with There were no rivets in the construction of any of this material. And whatever this strange thing was that flew that night over that farm, it managed to explode all this material, cover four fields with it, and then fly off again, undisturbed it appears. It's quite remarkable, and as this has not been identified in the last 20 odd years, we can only conclude, and this is as far as I'm happy to go, that this remains debris from a UFO, an unidentified flying object.
why did we do the crash sequence? Well, the crash sequence itself is is interesting, um, and it's interesting for two reasons. The, the first reason it's interesting is that the the physical evidence that was there at the time of the incident mm. was good enough to be able to reconstruct the nature of the craft. Right. Okay, you could very clearly see in the trees a twenty to twenty five foot wide channel cut through where the the flying craft had gone through and when it had exited the forest it had scattered the debris forward across the four fields so you could easily reconstruct from that exactly what had happened so mm -hmm. so uh, when you see the reconstruction on the dv you can see the craft coming down you know we've, we've done that we fudged that a bit and made it look you know a bit indistinct is the word i'd used it's very indistinct we, we haven't really made a meal of that the bit we have made a meal of, of course, is where the thing actually turns in trouble, swings down and then smashes through the trees, mm. because that is the factual bit. We know it did that. Uh, the reason we went for this shape, because I've actually got the model we used here, mm. it's quite an interesting one, this. Uh, the reason we went for this shape is that um, this is what is standardly referred to as a flying saucer, and it's about as bland and innocuous a shape as you can get. Uh, it's the same, same shade of green, roughly, as, as the original debris was, so we're assuming the outside of the craft was that colour. Um, and the other reason, the second reason why we went for this, is because it's actually got some writing on the bottom here, and people might notice. It actually says, Belling Bed Warmer. Mm. And for 50 pence on a local car <laughs> boot, I found this electrical apparatus that has a light bulb inside it you plug it in and shove the thing into your bed you see and it actually warms your bed up so this is a piece of archaeology from the late 1950s it was 1950s uh, blue grey when i bought it and um, i just thought it was amusing that we should be using a 1950s bed warmer as, as the shape for the ufo you see that crashed um, the other thing as well that's worth mentioning these these bobbles on the bottom are very um, indicative of um, a book that influenced me fairly early on. Um, my dad actually gave me a copy of it um, when I was a child, because it's a book from the 50s, which is this one, actually. This is the classic, um, Flying Saucers Have Landed. Mm. Okay, This is the George Adamski book that, that really pushed this forward. Um, it's debatable whether that's a clever model or whether it really is a UFO, but uh, it's got these balls underneath it, you see. So ever since this, UFOs have, have tended to take that shape. So um, it fascinated me. I mean, actually going through flying saucers have landed again recently, just going through this for research. Um, things really haven't changed, you know, since this book was done. Um, you know, I can almost imagine Adamski sitting there, you know, back when this was written and uh, working on his research notes, banging away on his typewriter. And, uh, and putting this together, I wonder. I wonder sometimes if he, um, if he actually knew uh, what effect this would have. 1953, that's when this was done. 1953. So you never know. 53, 83. Who knows? If it's human, somebody out there has the answer. Somebody. Somebody out there knows the answer. And if they're not telling us, then they've got a reason to not tell us. They've got their own agenda. And um, therefore, if it is human, then the rest of us, us mere mortals, will just have to continue with the limited knowledge we have. But if anybody out there does know any difference, answer's <laughs> on a postcard. <laughs> <laughs>